In a previous video, I talked about my first camera, the Little Smartest 127. And I think I received that, I wanted to say around 1971 or so. Anyway, by the time I was uh, 14, 13 years old, soon to be 14 years old, I, at that point I had accumulated all the knowledge that I needed in life to uh, move on to a, an SLR. Of course, I'm being sarcastic about that. I hadn't really accumulated all the knowledge that I would need in life, far from it. However, I did know that I wanted an SLR at that point, a 35 millimeter SLR, because certainly if I was going to be a photographer of any uh, of any renown, uh, I couldn't do it with a little uh, small folding camera that did not use 35 millimeter film. And so after going through many photo magazines and uh, looking at the prices, I settled on the Cosmerex SE, which is a camera that I could afford. Of course, I was subsisting on uh, basically nothing, my parents' uh, goodwill, and whatever tips I would earn from my paper route. Uh, Christmas tips were a big deal back then, and I usually was able to uh, uh, collect quite a bit of money. Uh, and I have to say that my uh, customers were always very generous. Some of my customers were very generous, so I was very appreciative of that. Okay, so this is the camera I settled on. I believe I went down to uh, a small camera shop on Forbes Avenue in downtown Pittsburgh. It might even have been called Forbes Camera, now that I think about it. I remember uh, going in there um, shortly after Christmas and looking around, looking on the shelves and seeing uh, many cameras. I, as I recall there was a Kodak Retina. I, in hindsight, it probably would have done better if I had purchased that camera, but that's not what I wanted. I wanted a new camera, and gosh darn it, uh, this was going to be the one. I sort of wish that the clerk had talked me out of it and may perhaps talk me into buying another camera, possibly even a Practica. He probably was just more interested in getting my money that day, cash, and not really worrying about what this young kid standing in front of him needed or should have considered. So that was that. I plopped down my money and minutes later I was out the door with my first 35mm camera. Uh, this is not the actual camera that I bought. I got rid of the original Cosmerex SE at some point, uh, right before I bought my bought my Pentax MX. What happened to it, I have to confess, I believe I just threw it into the trash. Anyway, let's take a look at the Cosmerex SE. The Cosmerex SE was made in the Soviet Union, and here was their little symbol that the Soviets put onto their, uh, their cameras and lenses. The Cosmerex SE is a very modest camera by today's standards, or even by standards of that day. Certainly a Pentax Spotmatic would have um, had many more features and probably had been more reliable than a Cosmerex SE. Uh, if you don't know, the Cosmerex SE is actually a rebadged Zenit EM. The Zenit EM was produced in the Soviet Union from 1972 to 1984. So it had quite a lengthy uh, production life, despite being not actually that great of a camera. But for me, it was my camera and I finally had a 35 millimeter SLR, and that was that. Interesting this, that the included owner's manual sold for a dollar separately. I've never seen it for sale separately. Uh, this is the this actually is the uh, original owner's manual. So I did not have the camera for some reason. I held on to the owner's manual, and you know, like most owner's manuals, it explained the operation, which I. Uh, which I soaked up in its entirety and then, you know, went through the various controls, uh, how to operate the camera, how to set the uh, film speed, how to take a photo, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it was a single language, entirely in English manual, which was nice. And then the back cover, once again, covered uh, the features on the back of the camera. As well, it's... It's, as you can see, as well as its uh, technical specifications. So let's skip that part of the manual and dive right into this camera. First of all, this used the 42 millimeter screw mount um, in, invented, invented, I guess you could say, was, or how about introduced by the Germans and used worldwide. Used by both Japanese uh, camera makers as well as obviously uh, Soviet camera makers, at least on the Zenit. This was a small self-timer lever, and that's all it did. Here was your flash synchronization post. So if you shot flash, you had no other choice but to use a flash synchronization post, and I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, this small little bar here is actually your uh, selenium cell. 
Uh, this was a common place to put a selenium cell. So this was a rather large selenium cell. The one in this one is dead. So let's check out the top of the camera. Here you have your film advance, and notice that the film advance is actually stuck in this standoff position. Um, it really should be sitting flat, flush, or not really flush, but flat against this uh, small little rubber bumper that you can see. So here's your frame counter. Um, this frame counter was manually set. It was not automatic uh, reset. Here's your shutter release. And here, this actually is your rewind switch. So a bit more primitive with this camera. This is your shutter speed selection dial. And as you can see with this dial, you really had only a limited number of speed. So after uh, your top speed of 1 500th of a second, you had 250, 125, 60, 30, and then B. There were no slow speeds on this camera. So that means nothing uh, slower than 1 30th of a second. Over here was your match needle system. You have your little eye. When you're uh, metering your scene, you would turn this in until it was centered over the needle. As I mentioned, the uh, selenium cell is either dead or it's disconnected. And so the meter needle does not react to light. And so generally how this would work, you would set your film speed in this little tiny crescent here that's visible. And then you would turn this outer dial until it sat over the needle. Once it sat over the needle, then you would read your aperture and shutter speed. I did want to mention that this has an accessory shoe. It's a removable accessory shoe and not a hot shoe. So that means there's no connection between here and your um, in the shutter for flash synchronization. As I mentioned, if you wanted to shoot with flash, you would have to run a cable right to your flash synchronization port on the front of the camera. Moving to the back of the camera. Very simple, all you had was your eyepiece. That was it. And the serial number for the camera. On the bottom of the camera, it's even simpler. You have uh, Made in USSR. Once again, you have that Soviet uh, production symbol. And you have your tripod post, or your tripod socket, which is way over here on the edge. Um, usually, you want to put it more in the center of the camera, and it certainly looks like there was room to do it, but... Perhaps there's some mechanism under here that prevented that. If you'll notice this shape, this shape is slightly uh, reminiscent of American cameras from the uh, 40s and 50s. To open the camera, you just put your thumb under here. There's a small little lever right here. You pull up, and the back pops open. The back does not swing into a 180 degree position like most cameras, it only opens to this point. This camera uses a horizontally traveling cloth shutter. So here's your pressure plate. The pressure plate is rather small compared with other cameras. And I think we've seen this before in a couple cameras, and it could have been a money saving move. That's going to be my guess. Uh, these, just small little spring here, just to keep your uh, film cartridge from rattling around in the film chamber. It's a very traditional layout with film running from left to right. And uh, here are your frame rails and your sprocket and your take-up spool. Take-up spool is not serrated. Sometimes you'll have a little serrated edge to help you uh, get the film started in the take-up spool. So the pressure plate, of course, keeps the film flat against the film rails so that when the shutter opens, it records as sharp a photo as possible. And that is always dependent upon you having a lens that is capable of recording a sharp photo. After you're finished shooting, when you want to rewind the film, well, this, uh, this little mechanism is slightly broken, so let me explain this. After, you're finished, after you finish with your roll, your back would still be closed. Wouldn't be like this. Um, generally, you would push down, turn this to the left, and this would pop up thing is not working correctly so this pushes far down beneath there making it almost impossible to raise it so you would take this and you would turn it to the uh, left in the direction of r you could raise this little rewind knob and then rewind your film in this manner there was no crank obviously and so the, this is what's known as knob rewind it was very common uh, by the 1970s uh, knob rewind had become a thing of the past so to see it on here is a little bit surprising, 
but keep in mind this is this is a Soviet camera, not a German camera, and certainly not a Japanese camera. And the Soviets were very slow to innovate. Um, I think most of the ideas that they got, they probably took from uh, the East Germans. I don't think they ever stole from the Japanese. So let's talk about the lens. As I mentioned, this is a screw mount lens. You can attach any 42 millimeter lens to the Cosmer X SE. This lens itself is fairly heavy. It seems to be reasonably well made. I recently lubricated it so it is uh, easier to focus. And here's your apertures with apertures running from f2 to f16. This would make this a most likely a planar type, but I would guess that they're borrowing their lens design from the East Germans. Regardless, this is probably a very, um, this probably was a very good lens. As I recall, I took a bunch of photos with it. I didn't take a lot of close ups. I don't even know what I was taking at that time. I think I was using it in high school as the unofficial photographer, or at that point, let me see, I would have been 13, so I guess I probably was in middle school. So, regardless, I was probably the unofficial photographer taking photos for the uh, school newspaper, which was not really printed on a traditional thing, but uh, it was hand cranked on a mimeograph machine. Only those of you who are old enough to remember a mimeograph machine will uh, know what I'm talking about. So in any case, uh, this is a 42 millimeter screw mount lens. On the bottom of the lens, you'll see this small little switch. It should close the, uh, it should um, switch it between automatic aperture and, and manual aperture. This camera itself has some issues, as you can tell. By the way, this is an all-metal lens. There are no rubber focusing rings on it. Um, so this is uh, serrated and scalloped, the focusing ring. So with this type of lens, there's a small pin here. This actuates the, uh, the aperture. And you can see it closed down once I push that pin. If I can find it. There we are. And the aperture here is reasonably uh, snappy. Now, if you set this to M, which you do, there's no markings on it. <laughs> there might have been at one point, but there's no markings on it. So if you turn this the other way, it will just close the lens down right away. So the way this camera is supposed to work is when you go to take your photograph, this little lever pushes forward, closes the pin on the aperture to your working aperture, or after you take your photo, this small little flap should return to a resting position and your lens should open up to its maximum uh, spot. Obviously, this camera's not working correctly. You have this standoff lever and it's just not working like it's supposed to. This is a ratcheted film lever, which is sort of interesting, but you can see how it doesn't ever return to its standoff position. The shutter release is sits slightly backward instead of forward, so you also have to get used to that. There's a lot you have to get used to with this camera. All right, as you can see, there were two flash synchronization op options, and you'll see this small, let's remove this, ironically. You can see this small little hash indicator here. So if you were using an electronic flash, you would put that little hash opposite the X. And if you were using bulb flash, you would then put that opposite the M. Also, you would set your shutter speed dial to 30. And you'll notice there's an X. The X just simply means flash synchronization. As you might expect, the uh, the viewfinder screen is not removable. It's fixed in place. The viewfinder was rather simple. Uh, there were no indications of shutter speed or aperture. And, you know, of course, you wouldn't really need them because you had to do everything while looking at the top of the camera. And that, in fact, made it quite sort of easy because you could see both your shutter speed and your apertures with the lens mounted to the front of the camera.
So the viewfinder just has a micro, micro prism spot in the middle surrounded by a ground glass collar, a coarse ground glass collar, and then set on a fine ground glass screen. Compared with other SLRs, this one is, the viewfinder is rather small. And you can see from the photo that I put up, there's, there's this vertical line in the center, and that is the prism desilvering. Of course, the only way to correct a prism that's been desilvered is to re replace it with uh, a prism from a donor camera. Because I won't be shooting with this, uh, I think we'll just leave that as is and let it slowly, uh, well, we're just going to leave that as is. The camera and lens are rather heavy, but I think most of the weight comes from the lens. So let's either prove or disprove that. Okay, so this camera is two pounds three, I think we could say that this camera is two pounds three ounces. We're gonna compare this to a Practica MTL-5. Although the Practica MTL-5 wasn't in introduced until much later, it didn't really change that much through the years aside from offering uh, faster shutter speeds. Remember, 2.3 ounces for this camera. And one pound 11 ounces for this camera. So that is, let's see, one pound 11 ounces, so that'd be another five ounces, and five, six, seven, eight, so that's half a pound. So if we look at the weight of the two lenses, so this is the Auto Cosmogon F2, 55 millimeter, 10.4 ounces. Now the, Practic now the Practica came with this Pentacon lens, multi-coated, it's a 1.8 50mm lens, being sli ever so slightly faster, uh, this one should actually weigh more, generally faster lenses weigh more than slower lenses. So this was 10.4 ounces, and how about this one, the East German lens, oh 6.8 ounces. Even if we round up, that's a seven ounces. So that's a three ounce difference. So that's, a, you know, that's significant. What about the weight of just the bodies themselves? One pound, eight and a half ounces or one pound, nine ounces for the Cosmorex. And one pound, four ounces. So again, five ounces. So between the two, you can see that uh, both the body and the lens weigh considerably more than their East German uh, rivals. These are affectionately known today as Kami cameras because they were produced in communist-controlled countries. So you can see how the Cosmorex actually sits taller than the Practica. What about back-to-back? -back? Well, back-to-back, -back, the Practica actually is a wider camera, so it's slightly shorter but wider and weighs half a pound less. So if we look at these two cameras, um, this one has many more features, right? First of all, it's working, but discounting that, uh, this has much wider range of shutter speeds, and I think it also has a rewind crank. This one, as we know, as we've seen in another video, has a vertically traveling metal shutter, and is still uh, quite usable today. Although I can't prove it, uh, the Auto Cosmogon lens is a coated lens, but I believe it might be a single coated lens. It just doesn't look like it's a multi coated lens. Again, that wouldn't be a surprise given the fact that it, was, that it was made in the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union was always trying to figure out a way to cut corners on something. So, my final rating for this camera is 8.2, and and it received a low rating simply because it really lacked the features the camera makers had come to expect by the early 1970s. You know, the fact that it didn't have any slow shutter speeds, it still had a knob rewind, and it had this little funky uh, little switch here. It still had a selenium meter. I mean, those features had largely gone away uh, in the mid to late 1960s. So, particularly, particularly when it came to. Um, single lens 35 millimeter SLRs. For its time, it was an adequate camera. It was not an excellent camera, but it was an adequate camera. But for 13 year old me, soon to be 14, this was a great camera because it was my first 35 millimeter SLR. I'll judge it according to my 13 year old self and say, hey, I love that camera and I did. And then I threw it in the trash. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. 
And if you'd like to, you can leave a comment below or you can send me an email at contact at camera-talk.net. And if you'd like to see more of my videos about cameras and photography, click on that icon here. And I hope to see you on the next video.